It is a great, great pleasure to be here, and I have to say to be back to Krems, where I came as a student 20 years ago. I don't want to admit how long. It might be longer. Uh, and had the pleasure of studying in Austria, and so I'm just delighted. That was in an earlier phase of my life, um, when I will not talk to you at the moment, but I, but I have in the past, and will be happy to say something about the direct connection between the interwar period in Austrian history and the birth of the open government movement. But that is another story for another time, which I will save. So I'm very happy to be here, a little bit jet-lagged, but uh, very delighted to be at this auspicious occasion. Um, so I was in thinking about and preparing for this talk, um, I was talking to my colleagues about what are some of the most recent and exciting examples of innovation, of tech-based innovation uh, that are transforming institutions. Um, wanting to mine for examples that were not simply uh, resting on old White House laurels uh, or dated to the ancient history of a year or two years ago, but wanting to look for things that were truly current. And what I realized is how much innovation is actually taking place in the private sector. <clears throat> if you take a look, for example, in the way that big data is transforming industries like retail, we all know about the Zara story, where they argue the Inditex, the company, is able to deliver practically in real time products to stores that are driven by the data about what customers want and what customers are buying, such that they can gather that data on the shop floor, produce new lines, and have it back into stores in a matter of a couple of weeks, not in a couple of months. Then you have the innovations, for example, in the way that the pharmaceutical industry is using collaboration and expertise, in this case, the Innocentive platform that was developed and uh, an offshoot of the Eli Lilly and other pharmaceutical companies to engage 270,000 problem solvers from across 175 countries in solving, if you will, outsourced problems from the pharmaceutical industry uh, that can't be solved by their internal R&D groups as cost effectively as outsourcing it to the crowd. This notion of turning to expertise is, of course, leveraged not only by big pharma, but is leveraged by banks and investment companies, almost all of which turn to using expert networking platforms like a Gerson Lerman, which boasts among its clients most of the world's largest global investment banks uh, and private equity firms in helping to source expertise to help them in making investment decisions. At the forefront, when we think about customer service, at least in the United States, is a company like Zappos. I'm not sure of their global reach, but my shoes probably come from Zappos, uh, as most of them do, because the customer service is so excellent that there's no reason why you would ever go to a store instead of actually buying your shoes from this online company that makes it simple to receive, uh, to buy, and to, re and to return in real time with a smile, effectively. Technologies like uh, recommender systems and other kinds of social techniques are, of course, and have been widely in use by places like Amazon, which also use real-time data tracking in order to customize the buying experience that we're all quite familiar with. And, of course, more recently, peer-to-peer -peer companies in the peer economy space, like Airbnb, like Uber, like Halo, are helping to disintermediate the middleman, in this case of the hotel, and allow you or me to actually rent out a room, a bed, uh, a, a house and turn our own um, lodgings into a hotel. Then, of course, there are companies like Facebook, which are not only using big data to target and algorithms and advanced math to target how they deliver advertising, but also really taking advantage of the trends we've seen in recent years of amateur content production, of what people do really, really well on networks to develop content together to build one of the world's most successful companies. Interestingly, almost none of that content, of course, created by Facebook, but all of it created by its users. Take a company like this one, uh, uh, Threadless, the t-shirt company, that of course is similarly based on a similar kind of networked business model of having the buyers, having its community actually create the t-shirts, which then others rate and rank, and then people purchase. So we see this tech-driven transformation of using data, of leveraging expertise, of really trying to use technology to deliver a much better customer service experience informed by social science. And by that I mean taking advantage of what we've learned about gaming, about games and prizes and challenges, about ways to nudge human behavior in specific directions to get people to buy things in new ways, of decentralizing the way that products are offered and created to offer and to operate in a much more network native way that takes advantage of what the technology makes possible. 
Of course, it helps to have the bottom line that help these transformations, these innovations, lead to real outcomes. In this case, selling more product. But the concern is, of course, that when we are interested in issues of public import and the public interest, that it becomes a little disconcerting that these innovations are not finding their way fast enough into governance. It's all well and good to talk about making clothes faster and better and driven by data, but ultimately a lot of that success, as we're learning, is on the backs of workers like these in Bangladesh who died in the fire that has led to the recent announcements by H&M and others to transform some of their business practices. It's great to leverage expertise on a network like Innocentive uh, to help Big Pharma, but unless we're making AIDS drugs available in Africa and otherwise thinking about public interest, if profit is driving, again, it doesn't help us to realize the benefits we're hoping for. Expert networking, the Gerson Lerman Group, uh, has recently been implicated, uh, perhaps rightly, perhaps wrongly, in some scandals. This is, uh, uh, again, the discussions about how expertise is being used in collusive ways to help in insider trading. And, of course, the peer economy companies like Airbnb and like Uber, which I think are doing wonderful things, are actually caught up and embroiled in legal battles right now in the challenges they're facing trying to do things uh, uh, that really go counter to traditional regulatory models. So how do we take these innovations to help us solve public problems, not just earn profit, but deal with issues of public health, deal with issues of enclosing the achievement gap in education, deal with the issues that we care about and that motivate us to be in this room? Tech has begun to enable tremendous transformations. I think largely because as we move into this government 2.0 world enabled by technology, it helps to make changes real in practice. We can do things with technology faster, and more importantly, we can do them very concretely. And I've seen firsthand the ways in which in government it's very easy to flip-flop between a policy about open in theory and another thing that when you have a platform like a data.gov that makes that real in practice, that it becomes very hard to walk back those transformations. We're seeing really interesting developments around the world in the use of new platforms, whether it's new kinds of commenting websites or new kinds of prediction markets like this one that's being experimented with by uh, the um, intelligence agencies in the US to look at how we can make decisions better. We saw examples of this sadly after the fact, not before the fact, in the effort to find the Boston bomber after the marathon a few weeks ago. And I had a chance to be involved in and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to experiment with and bring some of these platforms to bear in the government. Whether it was creating the first blog with comments on the White House website or working on data.gov and beginning to open up the data that the US and now so many governments have started to make available. Uh, this I didn't have anything to do with. I actually, when I worked in the White House, was told I may never mention the word hack in public, let alone hackathon. Uh, that was an unknown word, and of course, just a few months ago, the White House held its own hackathon using the data that it's making available to allow people to do things like improve the White House website. Challenge.gov, which I want to say a little bit more about in a minute, that's actually pushing out problems from government agencies to citizens to invite them to help solve those problems, partly as a way to engage people, and partly, frankly, as a way to circumvent rather What's the correct word? I won't fill in the word. Procurement processes that make it otherwise difficult to get a wide range of people to engage in and help with solving problems in new and creative ways. We're seeing, of course, experiments with crowdsourcing in new ways, like the Open Ministry Project in Finland and similar projects in Latvia and in Russia and elsewhere. Uh, and, I was, and I promised my colleague Johannes Pischler in Graz that I would mention the 11-1 project. Um, of, uh, in which I am quoted or uh, on the advisory or something, I'm on some kind of a proposal, um, uh, 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 again, about thinking about new ways of engaging people to help with decision making. But for the most part, government still looks like this, right? It's still, we're still here. This conference has been going on for five years because there's still a lot of, lot of work to do. Engagement is really hard. This is a cartoon that appeared, uh, I'm, I think, the dead body uh, lying on the floor, which is how I felt like it's Uncle Sam, but this was after we opened up the White House site to comments, created our open government uh, public engagement uh, process. Uh, I appeared in the New York Times. It was great uh, with a nice picture, but the article was about, um, well, it was essentially about how I was 
to put it colloquially, getting the crap beaten out of me by a bunch of people complaining about where the president's birth certificate was or whether uh, there were UFOs about to land or whether the president's birth certificate was on a UFO and other such incredibly <laughs> helpful things. And there was one guy who was really just wanted to complain about why he hadn't gotten his patent. Um, he was, and so, you know, we got, or we got lots of comments on why marijuana should be legalized. So no matter how hard we tried, uh, that's not true. I, we, tr we, we <laughs> when we opened up, when you open up a megaphone in a platform like this, it becomes very hard to get comments in ways that are manageable and meaningful in this kind of first experiment. I think there are a couple of challenges that are impeding some of our progress. Uh, and I know Tiago is going to say about more, a bit more about this, and we may get to this more in the Q&A. I know this will be provocative, but um, I pulled this off of a, a news story that I got yesterday. Um, is the, uh, so there is still very much an adherence in the communities that I have worked with, both as an academic and then who wield a lot of influence in places like Washington uh, and elsewhere, is around what, I, what I'm going to provocatively call the deliberation religion. In other words, that the focus needs to be on people, on communities talking to one another. And I'll say a bit more about what I see the challenge in that being. In other words, focused on talking, but disconnected often from how money is spent, how decisions are made, or how power is actually wielded. At the same time, the focus from the institutional side is always on bang for the buck, right? We don't want to do engagement because we're going to get a whole lot of people involved. So we put up things like the petition site in the UK, or in the US, which are frankly an utter waste of time because they have no impact, again, on decision making or on power, but they do get a lot of people signing things and getting more eyeballs on public websites. Or again, there are projects like this one that's in the news this week, Clear Health Costs, which uses crowdsourcing to create comparisons in private market healthcare economies like the US so you can identify the disparities in cost between getting a hip replacement in one jurisdiction versus in another one. We're now able to use government data to do this more accurately as well, but combined with crowdsourcing. But the point is, is that these are often very disconnected from real world institutions. So the question in my mind is how do we actually transition from a world in which we're thinking only about how people talk to each other to how we connect institutions and networks to engage in real collaboration. How do we create the threadless for government where we're doing the equivalent for the public sector of making t-shirts? In other words, real outcome-oriented problem solving. How do we move away from this mass-based conception of participation like these petitions or voting towards what I would call crowdsourcing wisely rather than widely, getting, having, drastically increasing the amount of engagement and again, how do we think about institutions that are actually able to solve problems using engagement? For me, this is an example I like to cite often because uh, I think it works and it's exciting and compelling. This is the fire department app from, I've forgotten the name of the place in California. What's the name of that place in California? You know all these, you know everything. Uh, San Ramon, California. Sorry, jet lag moment there. Um, so in San Ramon, California, where the, the uh, emergency services provides an app that allows me, if I am trained in uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, to receive notification when someone near me is having a heart attack. I can rush to their side and get there to apply cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, faster than the, than the first responders can, faster than government can, potentially thereby drastically increasing the person's chance of survival. I think a wonderful opportunity of citizens and institutions collaborating to solve the real problem of improving people's lives. And so the question in my mind is again, how do we take these innovations, it's a mindset if you will, but really these innovations that we're seeing in the private sector and apply it to the public. We did a conference a couple of months ago in New York City uh, that we nicknamed The Experiment. It was originally called Making Engagement Work, um, but we decided to call it an experiment because we knew that we would be grappling with some of these very, very hard problems and try to come up with some answers using a very diverse mix of people in the room together with coders and designers who would actually make prototypes of what we would articulate as potential solutions to these problems. 
Uh, this is organized by my group that we call the GovLab that I want to just state at the outset, and you'll understand already from my introduction what the sort of hypothesis is that we're operating under, what our sort of focus is, is really thinking about how do we actually, and starting from this research proposition, the more collaborative ways of working are actually not only better from a democratic standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, but actually help us to solve real problems in practice. At the experiment, we had real-world leaders like um, uh, Jean-Philbert Nisekimana, who's the Minister of Youth and ICT from Rwanda, who were in the room in every session to say, as leaders, we are here to listen to what people articulate and to implement what you suggest to us, or try to, who were there to really up the stakes and say, we care about engagement and we are willing to take a leap of faith at this point, not of evidence, that it can actually work to help us solve problems better. And so the question is, how do we fulfill their desire, their request to us to create engagement that actually works, that's manageable, that leads towards problem solving in the same bottom line ways that the private sector does, that isn't simply democracy theater? One hard problem that we grappled with and I think that faces us if we want to contemplate the future of engagement and in more engaged institutions is how do we actually find who knows what about stuff? How do we figure out who are the, what I'll call the experts? It was a project I started, um, I've, I've been working on for a long time as an academic standpoint. We articulated it as a public project that we called the Expert Net Project when I was in the White House and that we did not make a lot of progress on after I left, not in large part because we don't know how to do this. Now technologically we know a lot more about how to do this. It was just really for hard to find anybody willing to ask a question, but that's another point. Now, and that wasn't the case when we started this, we have projects like Vivo which is an interdisciplinary network to now connect millions of, uh, uh, or tens of thousands at this point, excuse me, of natural scientists across universities around the world in an open source platform. Science NV builds in vivo and others to build essentially these, think about it as Facebook for science. Think about it as LinkedIn for scientists or LinkedIn for experts. FDA profiles doing the same thing. These are all brand new projects that are just un unrolling right now. Think about the fact that when I was in government, there was no such thing as a directory which told you who worked in a government department and what they did and what their background or expertise was. We're now just beginning to take advantage of these tools like the Harvard um, Catalyst profiling sites, which is again a kind of uh, open Facebook, in this case for the medical and biomedical sciences, to help people with expertise find each other. The second piece though is even when I know what people are doing, even when I know what people know, I then still have to figure out how to interact with them. So I think the second set of research questions really array around how do I actually ask people questions in ways that are going to create incentives for them to participate and to participate in a meaningful and useful way. We can learn a lot from sites like Inicentive about how people do that. We can learn a lot from sites like Stack Exchange, which again are running, have millions of people participating, in this case mostly technical communities, every day and trying to answer and ask questions like how do I fold my socks in an efficient way? I picked this one because it was funny. Um, but actually there are 21 answers about the appropriate algorithm for folding your socks with 990 ratings that help us. And we're talking in a matter of minutes to days that you get these answers to help convert, converge around more accurate, more fact-based um, answers. There are projects like HealthTap, which now have doctors uh, available to answer uh, free que for free, quest short questions that you might have to a medical ailment. And now have they just uh, raised a huge round of funding and again being used to help ask and answer questions. MIT is doing some interesting experimental work on the Haystack project, again around this question of interaction. University of Southern California's play project is looking at uh, this issue of successful forms of interaction, this not around short questions and answers, but more around ideation and brainstorming and collaboration. Again, we have a long way to go, and I don't have answers today. We'll have to wait for CDM 2016, uh, maybe 2015, to be able to answer this core question. What kind of questions lend themselves to what kind of platforms, I was missing a word in here, to get answers? If I'm looking to brainstorm, if I'm looking to get a short answer, if I'm looking to write something together, if I'm looking to do the many kinds of information gathering activities I have to do in institutions that could benefit from engagement, we have a long way to go to mine what we're learning from the social sciences as well as from the private sector about how to do this. How do I actually create institutions from a legal and from a policy perspective that are ready and able to work in more open ways? 
So I think as we move towards thinking about how we reimagine how we govern, if we reimagine government or what we are, uh, uh, have called for a shorthand re-governance, we have to think about what are the new platforms that we need to create for solving complex problems together. Whoops. That was, oh, my nice picture. There was a picture here of bureaucracy. Maybe that's a, a, it's apropos that it somehow has deleted itself. Um, it's sort of the medium is the message, right? What I was going to say with this great archival picture was something to the effect of the platform of the 20th century was the bureaucracy that is organized in such a way to shield the decision maker from undue outside influence. It's organized to centralize information and to, because bureaucracies were often the best way and the best sources of information and the best libraries of expert information on a topic. We now know that this is not the case um, and that we have created institutions that exist to perpetuate themselves and to perpetuate programs that often do not work rather than creating uh, what a friend of mine refers to instead of says instead of the Department of Education why don't we have the department for helping children to read good the idea being instead we have specific silos around specific programs and we're not in an agile way thinking about what are the solutions that we can evolve quickly to helping us to do things. So let me close by saying I think there are a couple of important platforms that we need to focus on. My own work now uh, going forward is really, and it builds on work that I've done before around the peer to patent project, is thinking about how we build effective knowledge communities. How do we dig in on this question of how to ask and how to answer questions? Oh, there's my bureaucracy. Just, sorry, human error, not machine error. Um, I think there's a second, though, set of questions or a kind of plat set of platform issues around how do we actually make data useful. This is a picture of Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, who's spending most of his time now on the topic of what he calls social machines. I won't try to explain it except to say that he's thinking about now that we've unleashed all this data and are starting to make a lot of it open, especially government data, how do we actually make that data useful and usable to people to actually make decisions quickly and to build apps and innovations on top of it? How do we actually think about what are the platforms for matching skills to needs? This is a project that one of my students presented this week called the Compost Community Compost Connect. On the left he shows us Queens. These are all the uh, composting sites in Queens, uh, one on that side and one over here, and that's the entire region of Queens, most populous area of New York. Of course, there's no place to compost. This will seem very weird to people in Austria, um, but you actually have to get in a car and drive your stuff, your compost, to the composting site. Don't, we're, we're very backward, very, very backward in the U.S. in so many ways. He has this great idea that I have a car and you have trash, we could get together and I would drive your trash to the compost. Um, so I, I put this up because after listening to 45 oral presentations last week, I would say 25 of them were about the same topic. I have solar panels and you want to know about solar panels. I have blank and you want to blank. I have a blanket and you need a blanket after a, a, a hurricane or a storm. They all look like this matching skills to needs. We should have platforms that enable us to build the apps on top of it for doing this kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, problem solving and work together. And lastly, I think probably one of the most important platforms that we need to think about is what I'll call Metrics 2.0. In other words, now the typical way that we do evaluation and assessment of what's working uh, is too slow for the pace of innovation that we'd like to see. It is not good enough to give an academic like me uh, uh, you know, a check and a year to write a report about whether a project worked or didn't work. We need to think about ways in the way that you know, my shoes do or my clothes do uh, that talk to you in real time, that throw off data about how a project is actually working so that we can measure in real time. And we need to be able to take the kind of knowledge communities, the kind of expert networking that we see elsewhere to get larger numbers of people. Why isn't it that Vivo isn't being used to help to evaluate projects actually in real time? So I think when we start to move towards away from bureaucracy and towards platforms, when we start to move towards the use of data, collaboration, uh, um, uh, and driven also by insights in the social sciences towards a more agile mindset that actually allow us to focus on solving problems together that we might be able to rethink how we govern and how our institutions function more effectively. Thank you. <laughs>